Thank you, Patty, for lightening the mood before we talk about a heavy topic like cyber war. Um, I want to say good morning to everybody and just let you know what an honor and a privilege it is to be here with you today to talk about what I believe is truly the seminal technological and geopolitical topic of our time, which is how we prevent a cyber war. And I'm particularly inspired and excited to pose this question to this extraordinary group because the spirit of innovation that's in this audience and the technological expertise that lays before me is a big part of why I'm so optimistic that we're going to be able to navigate this challenge. But before we delve into this sort of you know, very challenging topic, I think it's worth reflecting back historically on how we sort of arrived at this moment where we now have to ask this sobering question. If we can go to the next slide, it's not, it's not working. There we go, thank you. Um, if we look at the last decade, decade and a half, this, cha this past chapter of our history has really been a story about the advent of technology, right? That is to say, it's been an access revolution. And during this time, billions of people have connected to information, to each other, and resources. And this group certainly understands the facts and figures and extraordinary tale of what's happened. So I'll just jump right to the punchline, which is by 2020, we're going to have more smart devices in circulation worldwide than the entire population of Earth. And it wasn't obvious that the devices would be cheap enough, ubiquitous enough, and have the supporting infrastructure such that I'd be able, for instance, several months back to take a trip to the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, spend time in the rural Fatah region, and have better 4G access on my phone than I do in, my, in the kitchen in my apartment in Manhattan. And that's the world that we've come to know. So what you conclude is that we're basically ready to close the book on this chapter of history, that we're moving from an era of the advent of technology to a moment where technology is now ubiquitous. And there's a lot of learnings that I think we should reflect on as we charter the path forward and navigate some of the major challenges on the horizon. Now, the first prescription that we should take away is it's been a mixed story. On the one hand, we've had extraordinarily inspirational stories of how technology has transformed people's lives in ways that we never imagined. And everybody in this room has one of those stories. If we can go to the next slide, there we go, thank you. Uh, for me, that story comes from a trip I took to Lahore several years ago, where I met a group of women who'd been attacked by the Taliban with acid. And through no fault of their own, the physical scars that they bear carry this terrible stigma in society. It prevents them from working, prevents them from getting jobs, um, and they all sort of gathered and lived together in this compound. And when I went to visit one of them, um, I asked her, because she was very cheery and laughing, Given everything that's happened, how do you maintain your resolve? And she held up her phone and she said to me, I never used the internet until I came here and I quickly realized that online my scars are invisible. And so the internet has given me a second chance at life. And the same woman went on to meet a man online who she eventually married. And these stories, everyone has them, they exist in every corner of the globe. They remind us that it's not just about the innovation and the gadgetry and the speed of our devices, it's about the ways in which it's really transforming people's lives. But we also know that it's been mixed. Again, if we can go to the next slide, please. We also know that some of the most heinous groups in the entire world, ISIS being the most recent example, have used technology to propagate, to recruit, They've used end-to-end -end encrypted messaging to coordinate logistics. ISIS has proven to be the very first terrorist organization to conduct an insurgency in both a physical and digital territory. Um, and we'll, of course, see more of this in the future. And then if we can go to the next slide, please. If we think about the relationship between social media and politics, from the United States to Europe to the Middle East, this has been one of the most mixed bags. It's been a story about a signal-to-noise challenge. Despite more voices, despite more commentary, despite more visibility, governments are finding it to be increasingly difficult to take measurement of their population sentiments. And it's leading to underreaction and overreaction in every corner of the globe. And there's a few reasons for this signal-to-noise challenge. The first has to do with the fact that demographics, our understanding of demographics, has completely changed. And I'll illustrate this with a series of questions to all of you. How many of you, by show of hands, have multiple email accounts? How many of you have multiple phone numbers? How many of you use multiple messaging apps? 
I could go on and on. But for all of you who raised your hands, and I assume it's several thousand of you, what you've just illustrated to me is that you have multiple personalities, that you're walking around with a virtual entourage, because you have all these different identities, because one is your family identity, one is your work identity. People like to misbehave, so I'm sure one of them is your rogue identity. So what you conclude is that the per capita influence of the physical individual increases extraordinarily in a world where we can prolifer proliferate versions of ourselves. And this is very confusing to governments, right? Take the country of Iran, 80 million physical citizens in that country. If they're all walking around with a virtual entourage of themselves to the regime in Tehran, it looks more like a population of a billion people. Complicating this further is the fact that the whole process of movement making changes. Movements that used to begin in private now unfold in public. Um, we're seeing the advent of transnational meddling, which adds another exacerbating factor. And so what we conclude from this last chapter of history in this era of social media and politics is that revolutions are now easier to start, but they're a lot harder to finish. And they're a lot harder to finish because the accelerated pace of movement making is in some respects slowing down leadership development um, at, the grass, at the grassroots level which is why we get all of these sort of unlikely leaders um, you know, leading these uprisings or just these leaderless movements altogether. And one of the challenges is that technology raises the expectations, and it's very easy for large numbers of people to organize around the lowest common denominator, which is often what's something we don't like, a particular leader in many cases. And then it turns out after that, there's not a lot else that they agree on. And this represents one of the seminal challenges that we've learned from this past decade. Ah, there it goes. So if we think about where this takes us in the future, whenever you're talking about geopolitics, we always like to talk in terms of polarity, whether it's the bipolar world of the Cold War, uh, the unipolar world of the sort of immediate post-Cold War era, the sort of multipolar era of the post-9-11 chapter, and some have talked about a nonpolar world. So again, I would argue that the polarity we're experiencing today is multidimensional. And the reason I say that is the introduction of such vast digital topography means that there's no longer such a thing as cyberspace. There's now just one international system, and it has a physical front, and it has a digital front, which means that all the challenges that have plagued the streets, all the physical world challenges that we've known for decades and centuries are now spilling over online and have a digital manifestation. Our understanding of state power also changes. It's always been the case that um, economics, politics, and the military determines which states are powerful and which are not. These attributes remain the same, except the powerful states are going to be the ones that can project influence in those areas in both a physical and cyber domain. And if you think about this, you get certain countries like the United States and China that have a robust technological ecosystem as well as they are sort of pre-existing superpowers. They gain disproportionately in this new hybrid world. Um, you get countries like Russia, which in a world that was purely physical was, for all intents and purposes, a declining power that's now been able to resurrect a lot of its Cold War tactics in a world that's as much digital as it is physical. You get adversarial nations like North Korea and Iran, um, who in a world that's purely physical are sanctioned and pariah nations. Uh, but in a hybrid world, they're willing and able to deploy some of the most nefarious cyber tactics around the world, which again give them disproportionate influence. And then you get your gems like Israel and Singapore and Estonia that are able to punch way above their physical weight and size and project extraordinary influence in the international system. But another aspect of this multidimensional polarity is that if the world is hybrid, every country is going to have two foreign policies. They're going to have one for the physical side of the world and one for the digital side of the world. And by the way, they're not always going to be consistent. So let's look at the relationship between the United States and China as just an example. In the physical world, um, the two countries are sort of frenemies and have a complex relationship, but it functions and it works. If you look at the digital relationship between the two governments, it's more adversarial, kinetic, and warlike than the physical one between the United States and North Korea even at this moment. So in this multidimensional world, how do we navigate the contradictory foreign policies that states practice towards one another? And of course, with this recalibration of power and this change in terms of how we think about the international system, we're looking at old challenges manifest themselves in new ways and in new theaters. 
And the most obvious observation that I'll make is that in the future, I believe that all wars are going to begin as cyber wars. And they're not necessarily going to spill over into the physical domain. They're going to unfold silently and visibly, relatively inexpensively, and they're going to really be defined by the marriage or the union of traditional hacking of systems and infrastructure with growing efforts that we're increasingly seeing to hack the conversation and hack the discourse, which we've sort of largely thought of as these disinformation efforts. Now, not all states will possess the same capacity, so we should assume that states that don't have the organic capability of doing this may go out and procure this on the black market. We may see some countries get back in the business of state-sponsored、uh, state、terrorism in the digital sense. And then, if you look at countries like Ukraine, countries like Syria, you see what modern warfare looks like in these contexts, where you have physical war, you have hacking of systems and infrastructure, and then you also have robust disinformation campaigns happening on top of it. And what you realize is that historically, violence has been used to destabilize the physical state. But how well a society is able to function is an aggregate of its physical stability and its digital stability. So, if violence is how one destabilizes the physical state, then the erosion of truth、um, and the sort of prevention of the free flow of information is how the information side of the state gets destabilized. And there are several tactics that we're seeing governments increasingly look to. The most obvious one that people talk to is fake news.、Um, you know, I would argue that fake news has be it's become this umbrella term for a lot of different things.、Um, I would argue it's one tactic in a larger arsenal of adversarial state behavior. It's the digital equivalent or the next chapter of propaganda.、Um, and by the way, there's a lot of different definitions of it. You have the second tactic,、um, which I call patriotic trolling. This is basically when cyberbullying becomes better organized, better funded, and state-sponsored. So when President Erdogan in Turkey, for instance, decides that he doesn't want to tolerate independent journalism, he deploys state-sponsored trolls to attack female journalists with dozens of rape threats every single minute across multiple platforms. And this has a profound impact on taking key influencers、um, out of the conversation. And then the last tactic is what I just sort of describe as the digital equivalent of paramilitaries. This is governments literally creating fabricated accounts based on stolen photos、uh, that are designed to represent key constituencies in faraway societies. They build up these accounts to look and feel like the people that you think you're interacting with, and then they look for trending conversations around the world that they don't like. That represent fissures in other countries'、uh, societies, and they strategically deploy these accounts to interact with you and me. And the goal there is to foment chaos. At times, it's to flip an outcome.、Uh, they use these to disseminate secrets, and at times, they even try to use them to organize offline events. Now, the problem with all of this is when you think about whether you're talking about cyber conflict or cyber war or disinformation. From a government perspective, if you look at the international system, there's no rules that govern how states respond to each other when attacked, right? There's no doctrines of proportional response for the cyber domain, and as a result, we have a general absence of deterrence. You know, something which we had during the Cold War to help keep things stable. And there's a few reasons for this. Attribution is much harder in the cyber domain. Oftentimes,、um, it's extremely difficult to know who attacked you. Sometimes, by the time you get attacked,、um, years can go by. After which, the context has changed. Everybody's moved on. Relationships have changed. We don't have legal frameworks that define this.、Um, you don't have the equivalent of the nuclear hotline that we had during the Cold War.、Um, you know, so, so all of this is sort of uncharted territory. And there's been experiments that governments have done. So, for instance, after the Sony hack by North Korea. Uh, the United States responded with a new round of sanctions after the Iranian regime、uh, attempted to hack a dam in the United States. A number of Iranian hackers were indicted and put on trial. But the problem with all of this is none of this sort of rises to the level of creating any kind of meaningful deterrence. None of this, you know, creates that sense of mutually assured destruction、um, that made these sort of responses seem credible. So the question then is: if there's no rules, and if 195 countries are basically engaged in a perpetual state of cyber conflict. How do you prevent that from escalating to a point where the next great war is a cyber war? And I think this is the question that should be top of mind for all of us. And the answer is there's no perfect panacea to this problem. 
there's certainly things that I think governments are uniquely positioned to do. You know, for instance, can governments build an understanding of low, medium, and high intensity targets so that all the countries are operating based on the same, voca uh, same vocabulary? So for instance, you know, can countries even agree on what types of targets constitute critical infrastructure? Or what are the types of targets that, if attacked, could lead to loss of human life? So that way, again, as they're formulating doctrines of proportional response, they can speak with the same language and the same taxonomy. There's also a lot that governments can do to use foreign assistance to help build out the technological infrastructure to be sufficiently robust. Government can always do more to practice better cyber hygiene. You know, all the sort of campaigns that are funded around uh, physical health, um, there's an opportunity to fund similar campaigns around citizen cyber hygiene, um, since at the end of the day, one of the best ways for society to protect itself is for all of its citizens to practice that better hygiene. Um, but ultimately, there's a burden sharing that happens, right? While governments are trying to figure this out in the cyber domain, and while governments are trying to figure out how they make sense of this new chapter of conflict, I think that there's an opportunity for private sector companies to step up. I think that there's a particular role for private sector companies to play around some of the digital aspects of these challenges. And I'll give you just a few examples. The first has to do with the global conversation. If you think about the internet as just one big conversation that's playing out all the time, um, for all of us who are online, one of the most universally understood challenges that we encounter is just the general decline of civility of conversation. The statistics tell us that 72% of people connected to the internet have witnessed some kind of online harassment. Another 47% have personally been victims of online harassment. And another 27% say that they actively self-censor out of a fear of some kind of retaliation. So we think of this as the cyberbullying problem or the meanness problem. But if we put it in a geopolitical context, you think about all the societies that are newer to the internet. These are countries that are ridden with ethnic, political, and sectarian conflict. What we think of as meanness and cyberbullying may become the next wave of sectarian, ethnic, and political conflict. And it's going to play out online in the form of toxicity long before it's going to spill over into the streets as violence. Now, if you had asked me two years ago, I would have said this is a seemingly intractable problem. But there's a few things that have changed. The amount of training data that's out there um, around toxicity and various other emotional attributes allows us for the first time to use machine learning to try to facilitate better conversations. So one of the things that we've done at my Alphabet group, which is Jigsaw, is we've built a machine learning model that helps publishers and platforms measure toxicity on the internet. And the way it works is they basically run all their comments through our API, which is free, by the way, and it returns a score of 0 to 100 of how likely that conversation is to make, uh, how likely that comment is to make somebody leave the conversation. And if the internet's made up of publishers and platforms, what can they use this measurement tool for? Well, some of them are using it to scale moderation. Others are using it to empower the reader to dynamically turn the volume up or down, depending on what their own toxicity threshold is. And then some are using it to create kind of the equivalent of a spell check for toxicity. So I give this as sort of one example that can happen across lots of different platforms. And if we get it right, if we help publishers and platforms you know, navigate the complexity of civility in conversation, then I think we have a reasonable shot at ensuring that the nastiness of the physical street that we see playing out around the world doesn't spill over online at a scale that becomes unimaginable. And then the last example I'll give has to do with violent extremism. As I mentioned earlier, we know that terrorists, ISIS being the most recent example, uses the web to recruit. So I've looked at this space for a long time and asked myself the question, what can we do that's different than just sort of throwing out a bunch of videos that are produced with Hollywood-esque content and hope that it changes a bunch of people's minds who might want to join an extremist group? Well, we have sort of an anthropological and investigative approach to Jigsaw, so we sent a team of people to Iraq uh, where they interviewed a dozen people who had recently defected from ISIS in just the last several weeks. Similarly, we, similarly, we've interviewed people who got arrested trying to join ISIS in Europe and elsewhere to try to understand the role of technology in the recruitment process. And what we concluded from this is, as it pertains to targeted advertising online, the most effective tactic is to focus on the people who are already radicalized and trying to search to figure out how to take the next step. We then worked with counter-extremism organizations around the world um, to develop AdWords, 
uh, video ads and display ads that looked like answers to the questions that these young people were searching for. Because the sort of teenage ISIS defectors that we interviewed, it turns out that, like all teenagers around the world, they don't click on things unless they look like answers to their questions, and they certainly don't click on things that look like they're challenging uh, their teenage views. So then when they click on these ads, as you can sort of see it on a, on a reel up here, where do they go? Well, it turns out from the interviews, we also learned that you don't need that Hollywood-esque content. It turns out that they don't care about the quality of the production. They care how well the video answers their question. And there's plenty of content that exists already online to be repurposed for this. So we engage counter-extremism organizations around the world to repurpose literally thousands and thousands of existing organically uploaded content in English and in Arabic on YouTube, such that when somebody is searching for, you know, how do I become a nurse uh, for the Islamic State, and they then click on an ad saying, learn everything you need to know about becoming a nurse in the Islamic State, they get redirected to a video that shows them that the hospitals are being used to store weapons, not to treat patients. And we're able to get real analytics on how many people who searched for A, clicked on B, went to video C, and how many minutes they spent engaging. So I give you these two examples to just leave you with one final point from Alphabet's executive chairman, which is there's obviously a huge role for government to play, but in this new hybrid world, it's unfair for us to expect government to shoulder the entire burden. There's a huge role for all of us in the tech sector to play. Whether you're at a company or you're an individual entrepreneur, um, our most precious resource is our engineering capacity. And as we think about all of the challenges spilling over online, there's never been a moment in time where that capacity has been more needed. Thank you all. You've been a great audience.